welcome to another STARS webinar. I am David Dorn, Director of Programs and Communication at STARS. This is our 25th um, STARS webinar. For those of you who are here for the first time, STARS webinars are interactive discussions about future-oriented topics such as leadership, geopolitics, technology, climate change, and health. Over 200 participants are attending today's webinar live and hundreds more watch the recordings later on um, in STARS Insights. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you. Today we talk with the co-founders of BioNTech, Professor Dr. Uhur Shahin and Dr. Özlem Türeci about what their scientific breakthrough in mRNA technology means for the future of health. In January 2020, when the world had yet to realize the looming threat of a global pandemic, Uhur Shahin and Özlem Türeci launched Project Lightspeed. Using mRNA technology, they succeeded in developing the world's first vaccine against COVID-19 within less than a year and with 95% efficacy, a world record from every perspective. Their groundbreaking research truly changed the world for the better as it saved millions of lives and gave people back the hope of a free life. Dr. Shahin, Dr. Tureci, good morning to both of you and thank you very much for taking your time to talk with us today. Good morning, David. It's a pleasure. Hi, David. Pleasure to be here. We now have 30 minutes to discuss with Dr. Shahin and Dr. Tureci. I have crowdsourced some questions among the participants in advance, and I will kick off with these questions right away. In the meantime, if anyone has further questions, um, please use the Q&A feature below to type in your question. Uh, without any further ado, let's get right into it, and let's start with the topic of leadership. Uh, the first question comes from STARS alumnus Dominic von Planta. He's the COO of Schwind iTech Solutions. He's asking, what have been the leadership challenges in scaling from startup to business partner of a global pharma company? And how did you manage those challenges? Uh, um, you can go. Yeah, yeah, you can start. Yeah. So, so the typical business challenges, of course, as a startup, uh, to uh, uh, which is focused on technology, uh, to enable technology and clinical development is in a timely fashion and uh, and address address all all the requirements for innovation development. Uh, for a partnership with a with a with a large pharmaceutical company like like Pfizer, uh, it is important that both partners understand their strengths and uh, act um, in a in a way that is driven 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 by by clear decision making and and our decision making making rational in the partnership was always uh, driven by science and 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 data. Uh, so, and uh, we understood that our strengths are based on technology development, on the science, on immunology, on the first first um, early phase of vaccine development. Uh, we clearly saw the, the strengths of our partner in, in executing large clinical trials as well as having a global network. Uh, and 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 uh, and accordingly accordingly we really worked and brought together complementary strengths and worked in a respectful manner uh, and decision making was not based on who who has the last decision vote but it was based on the idea what it, uh, what uh, in which direction science is going to guide us how would you describe your own leadership style and, and has it changed over time from your early startup days until today um, I, I can start here maybe. Uh, um, it, uh, the leadership style uh, in, in principle uh, um, stays uh, quite stable because it's, it's, it's part of a personality. It's, it's, uh, it's part uh, of how someone is. Techniques change, I would say. And uh, they have changed over time because they have to adapt to the respective challenges which come with transformation and which come with growth and which come with implementing different levels of changes when you go from a start up uh, towards becoming a fully integrated vertically and horizontally integrated um, organization. Um, uh, I would say that uh, we both have uh, 
cooperative leadership style uh, where the, the, the objective is to involve and, and build uh, our team and um, uh, uh, don't uh, rely on, on sort of uh, individual skills, but on, on uh, swarm intelligence, uh, uh, if you want. Uh, so, and, and mobilize everyone who can, uh, who can um, uh, contribute. Yeah, I can, maybe I can add to that. It is really important that, that during the transformation of, the, of a company uh, which is going and, and is, is becoming larger, and that the strengths of a startup are not lost. The strengths of a startup is uh, that, that, that the decisions are really made uh, in, a, in a way that everyone understands, understands the basis for decision making. Yeah. And, uh, and, uh, and it is also important, important uh, to ensure, ensure that the right people who really see the details are, are involved. And this is easier in a startup. Uh, if, if you grow, and, and the, the easiest, easiest techniques for growing is, is building large departments and providing, providing uh, so defining people who, who, who lead the departments. But at the end of the day, it does not change because within the departments, you have to have uh, at every level, at, in, uh, for each detail, people who can make decisions. And therefore, the most important aspect of leadership is to create new leaders who can, who can, who can lead smaller teams. And these leaders have to identify additional new leaders so that we can grow in a, in a, in a fashion like crystallization where, uh, in which every, every, every uh, leader has its own, own small group uh, who, uh, with, with a clear oversight and, and that everyone is connected to a decision making process chain. Yeah. The next question comes from Stars alumnus Timo Krieger. He's a senior professional in maintenance methods and tools at Schindler. Uh, he's writing, the last two years must have been highly demanding for you, especially as you had to constantly manage expectations, change and pressure from the whole world. Uh, what have been your personal learnings from the last two years? Um, one of the personal learnings uh, has been that um, uh, it, that uh, uh, sometimes uh, in in some situations uh, it um, may it may have uh, uh, advantages not to to insist on a perfect plan uh, before you start uh, your endeavor. Um, it's it's not quite a new learning. It uh, it is something which has. Uh, accompanied us from, from the very beginning, but these last 14 months made very clear that uh, there is power in just daring to start and uh, to solve the problems which you encounter on new territory on the go. And um, so, so, so uh, the last uh, year has encouraged at least me to, to continue and to further build on, on uh, this uh, style of problem solving. Yeah, and what is also important is, so this year, this year was, um, was indeed, indeed a special challenge in, with regard to expectation management. On the one side, uh, we, had, we had to communicate when we, for example, expect uh, to start clinical trials or when do we expect uh, to, get, uh, to get data. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, on the other side, we wanted to avoid that people uh, and, uh, believe that the availability of the data uh, means availability of the vaccine or that the data are going to be positive. And, uh, and in my interviews with, uh, with, with the press, I always, always communicated, we are going to see now the data in two months or we are going to see them, uh, the data in two weeks. Yeah? But we do not know if the data uh, are going to be positive or not. Yeah? So with this type of communication, you communicate the, the timelines, but you don't communicate the results that are going to, 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 uh, to, to um, uh, to come and and this I think this is this is fine if you if you if you have uh, create a situation where people can prepare themselves 
yeah but are also uh, prepared that there might must be uh, there could be negative results and and luckily uh, luckily all the results that we um, generated so far uh, were great and supportive how did you decide to pivot towards covid-19 vaccine development and what did it mean for the company and how did you manage to convince stakeholders that this was the right move Yes, it was um, uh, based, uh, this, the decision was based on the understanding that uh, we were uh, navigating into a global, uh, oh, what happened there? Uh, uh, it was based on the understanding that we were navigating uh, into a global uh, threat. Um, uh, Ugo uh, read, uh, a, a Lancet paper uh, in which um, the Wuhan situation was described in a familiar cluster and uh, his, his understanding from that was that we were in, in fact in the midst of a pandemic. So the question for us as a team at BioNTech and our friends uh, and comrades there was not uh, should we pivot or not, uh, we had to pivot. We saw this as a, a duty, but it was more about how can we do it in a way that uh, we can indeed contribute at the end to a pandemic. Uh, so that was a, a, a very organic decision to take because we were convinced that with our technologies and with our skills and capabilities, we could really contribute. And um, uh, so it was, uh, uh, n there was not much hesitation and everyone involved uh, was also easy to convince. We have a question from Stars alumnus Wolfgang Kantor. He's Vice President of Global Marketing and Strategy at BASF. He's writing, Biontech's vaccine was developed in record time, only a few weeks after the virus had been discovered. Is mRNA technology the key to this faster than ever development of a vaccine, or why is the development so much faster than established technologies? So it, it is a combination of, of things. First of all, first of all, um, uh, it is a technology uh, allowing allowing to take a, a piece of genetic genetic information and encoding that with mRNA and delivering a vaccine to to. Uh, to, to human beings who make the vaccine. So this is this is the technology. And the second is is our expertise in the last 20 years to develop to develop cancer vaccines and immunotherapies, uh, and uh, and understanding how to design a vaccine, how to make it powerful, how to ensure that we get this, that this type of strong T cell responses, antibody responses, and so on. This is really based on a immune engineering skill. And the third aspect was, uh, was that we, uh, that our teams uh, were focusing on, on personalized cancer vaccines. A personalized cancer vaccine is, is, a, is a vaccine where, uh, where we first analyze uh, the tumor, tumor uh, 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 genome of a cancer patient and then uh, uh, and engineer a tailored vaccine for the cancer patient. Uh, and deliver the vaccine back to the cancer patient. And this has to be done in as short as possible time frame, uh, because the, the patient with the cancer, of course, is waiting for his treatment. Uh, so that means we, we had all the processes in place, allowing us uh, to, to generate new vaccines, genetically engineered vaccines, within a few weeks. And we did that before we, uh, we started our vaccine development for, for hundreds of cancer patients. That means we could rely on this process in developing a vaccine in an extremely short time. We have a question from Stars alumna Emanuel Ferrari. She's the head of internal audit APAC at Novartis. Um, she's asking you, why do you think that innovations for this pandemic have come from smaller biotech companies? What are big pharma companies missing to be innovative? <laughs> Difficult question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Do you want to go? go I, I, I can I can start. I think I think I think um, uh, innovation innovation uh, such type of innovation uh, uh, really requires uh, a 
change uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the demand. Yeah? Uh, so so um, and the usual situation is, uh, and big pharma, uh, pharma companies are really great in that, is optimizing processes yeah, for the existing, existing demand. Uh, and, uh, and if we see the vaccine field, for example, the vaccine field did not change, change the, the last uh, 20, 20 years or even the last 50 years, the, the process of making a flu vaccine is still the same because, because it is so difficult to enter the market. Yeah, with a new technology and, uh, and have this type of investment. Uh, what, what biotech does is, is really, really uh, um, uh, seeing the things from the other perspective, seeing it, what type of problems are not solved yeah? and, and, uh, and what kind of technology and innovation could, could, could help here. And of course, this type of innovation development requires 20 years of research and 80 and 90% of concepts do not work. Yeah? So that means we have a situation where, where the risk taking is on the, on the side of biotech yeah? in, in believing into things which are not yet proven and the strength in, in pharma in, in executing and optimizing things which are existing. And, and, and this, this, this will definitely not change because you need for biotech, you need really another type of culture and, and decision making based on not proven, proven evidence. Yeah? And uh, so, so, so pharma is more evidence driven, yeah? but, but, but for innovation, there is no evidence at the beginning. There is a belief and uh, rational and uh, and this is this is the way uh, how 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 different uh, different parties and, and stakeholders can can complement each other. We have a question about vaccine production in Africa. Uh, the question comes from Stars alumnus Sasha Chandaria. He's the CEO of Orbit Chemical Industries, based in Nairobi. Um, he writes. Africa is so far behind in getting coverage and the biggest challenge is logistics as well as supply. Is there any possibility BioNTech would consider production of the vaccine in Africa? Yes, 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 we are, we are discussing that with stakeholders, yeah, and we consider indeed in, indeed in building, uh, building manufacturing capacity for Africa, yeah. We have a um, question from an expert from STARS alumna and immunologist Katja Fink. Um, she writes, currently circulating virus mutants mostly emerged in non-immune cohorts and improved the ability of the virus to bind to and infect host cells. Once a large part of the population has been infected or vaccinated, the virus will also try to escape the immune response, possibly producing a completely different set of virus mutants. Um, how could this affect vaccine strategies in the future? And what is BioNTech's approach to address this potential problem? Uh, yes, this is, this is, this is exactly, exactly what is going to happen. We have at, at the moment, in principle, two types of, of uh, virus evolution. The virus evolution in the uh, non-infected population, which is, which is an evolution for fitness. And then we have uh, already ongoing second and third waves in, in, in Africa and in Brazil, uh, where the virus evolution is already driven by, by fitness to escape, uh, escape, escape mutation. And uh, mutations which, which provide escape for existing antibody response uh, ha have already been well characterized, uh, not only by the existing virus, uh, by the emerging virus variants, but also by laboratory experiments. And we are prepared to address them. Yeah? Uh, we are evaluating each, e each week um, uh, up to dozens of new variants. Uh, and we are ready to prepare a vaccine in a short time if indeed an antibody escape variant uh, uh, would emerge yeah? uh, with, the, with the right mutations to, to, to induce, in, induce a second wave of uh, immune responses. And that's also the beauty of RNA technology that it is so highly adaptable with a very short turnaround time to uh, generate a a uh, variant uh, vaccine, uh, that's one. And the second is uh, you can uh, boost uh, endlessly uh, in principle um, and uh, 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 mix and match with new upcoming variants 
to modify the immune response and adapt it. The next question that builds on that comes from Stars alumnus Jordan Isaac. He is the assistant um, to the chairman of OUE based in Singapore. Um, he's asking, do you see that the vaccination will become a yearly regimen similar to that of the common influenza vaccine? Yeah, it appears uh, uh, that this situation is realistic. So we need we need relatively soon a first booster uh, vaccination. Um, the booster vaccination most likely will uh, will help us to have sufficient antibody titers to avoid infection uh, um, for 12 months. So, so it is at the moment we believe uh, every 12 months uh, revaccination is a is a real scenario. We have a question from Bruno Gehrig, um, board member of Nerki Baumann, former chairman of Swiss and Swiss Life and former board member of Roche, um, UBS and the Swiss National Bank. Um, how do you assess the future of the two vaccines, the mRNA vaccine, which uh, you and Moderna is using, and the vector vaccine that Johnson Johnson is using? Mm. I do not know if the question is uh, 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 whether you can prime and uh, boost with different vaccines or, or whether the question is more in the direction which type of vaccine vaccines will, will evolve in the future. I think it's generally aimed at what, how do you see the potential of the mRNA vaccine and the vector vaccine um, yeah. in the future? Yeah, Scientific, scientifically, I would say uh, that mRNA vaccines um, have the advantage that they can be used for repeated uh, vaccination cycles. So the booster vaccines will definitely benefit benefit from from mRNA mRNA vaccination approaches. The uh, the vector vaccines come with the challenge that that this uh, that, that the the boost immune response. Uh, is, is limited by the backbone uh, immune response. This is a special uh, scientific or technical challenge. And uh, we believe that mRNA vaccines have a, have a bright future. I can't comment on, on the vector vaccines, but for, for mRNA vaccines, I, I, could, I would say this, this is a bright future with, with, a, with a minimal essential delivery of genetic information, which is instable and degraded within a few days. So this, this is a great safety, safety, scientific safety rationale. We have lots of questions about the potential of uh, mRNA technology. So I'd like to ask you to go into some more detail if possible. What do you see as the potential um, of mRNA technology more broadly in, in healthcare? The, the potential is, uh, is, uh, 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 is huge. Um, uh, uh, RNA technology has uh, uh, a very broad bandwidth. Uh, it can be used for in principle, all purposes uh, for which you would uh, uh, nowadays use uh, use protein-based uh, technologies and and uh, and drug formats, um, it's it's uh, vaccines, both uh, preventive and therapeutic ones. Uh, it is um, uh, um, uh, uh, encoding cytokines, encoding proteins, encoding hormones. It also is uh, suitable for different indications and therapeutic areas. Uh, we um, uh, have been focusing in, on, on cancer therapeutics in the past. We have now seen with our COVID-19 vaccine development that uh, infectious diseases is, is an area in which um, uh, mRNA technology is uh, very valuable and other uh, areas are, for example, autoimmunity. Uh, we could show preclinically that mRNA um, uh, technology can on the one hand boost immunity and induce immunity, but you can also use it to suppress immunity so that it becomes also interesting for um, autoimmune diseases or allergies or inflammation. The next question comes from Stars alumnus René Buholzer. He's the CEO of Interpharma. Um, in your view, what are the key ingredients for Europe to remain or become a leading pharma and biotech hub in the future? 
Yeah, it's it's really believing innovation, yeah, and bringing bringing technologies technologies different type of technologies together, yeah. Uh, so so uh, the great really great advantage of uh, of the United States is is believing and investing into things before they are real, yeah. And that is what we have to do in Europe. We have to believe into the future. Yeah? We are living now in a time where the innovation cycles will be faster, where, where novel innovations will, will, will emerge by, by bringing scientific insights and technologies from different fields together. This is uh, digitalization, this is automation, and this is genetic engineering. This is, um, this is combinatorial uh, medicine approaches. We are living in a, in a world, in a aging, in a world with aging population with increasing, in, increasing medical need uh, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in various populations. And therefore it's just time, time really for, uh, for investment into new technologies and, 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 and uh, just having the courage uh, to yeah to evaluate new concepts. We have a question from Starzalamis Andreas Kempf. He's the head of corporate auditing, risk, and quality management at Carl Zeiss. What would you guess? Uh, what will be the next pandemic? And is there a general cure for more coronaviruses that will come in the future? Uh, you, I, I guess we cannot answer what uh, and when the next pandemics will come. We can, however, say that there will be next pandemics, uh, uh, several of them, uh, because simply uh, the, 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 the mobility we have nowadays uh, uh, is, 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 um, uh, is a, a large trigger for, for um, uh, pandemic uh, situations. And um, uh, being prepared using this pandemic now uh, to prepare for the next one, uh, because this is sort of uh, uh, the, the drill uh, to um, also identify uh, all those aspects in which we are not prepared and address with them uh, is what we should also take out of this um, uh, experience now as a global community. Building on this question, we have another question from Stars alumna Pascal Ineichen. She's the head of corporate communications at Zur Rose. Um, she's asking, what would need to be done on an international level in order to be better prepared for the next pandemic? Yeah, so this is this is um, this this is this is in, in, these are important questions. The first one is uh, so the the greatest challenge that we had uh, had seen in the last uh, last. Uh, six nine months uh, is the manufacturing challenge. So that means we really need uh, require a manufacturing concept in place and manufacturing uh, capacity that could allow us to to ramp up much faster than we were able to do to do now. So when we started, so in, uh, when we started the vaccine development in 2000, our manufacturing capacity was about um, about up to 100,000 vaccine doses per year. We have increased that now to more than two billion doses a year. Uh, this was possible. Possible we had because we had already the uh, scale up technologies in place. Luckily, yeah. but the next time we really need, require the manufacturing capacity, and as already discussed, not only in Europe, United States, but also in Asia and in Africa and South South America, in in a strategic manner. The second aspect is is um, is to ensure information flow in an extremely fast fashion. Uh, the structures that have been now generated for monitoring of SARS-CoV-2 variants uh, uh, can, be, can be reused for this purpose, but we need also a, st a strategy for decision making, for example, what kind of, of uh, so how, how the vaccine should be engineered. And the, the last aspect, of course, is we need international harmonization, yeah? how to deal with emerging outbreaks. Uh, so um, the situation, for example, if we go back uh, to, to January, uh, January um, uh, to, uh, to 2020, um, in uh, there were a number of a number of um, 
of countermeasures to keep to keep uh, the the outbreak uh, local but one of the one of the measures were were allowing uh, people without symptoms to travel yeah and we have to res discuss that the next time because we, we we now know and this was also the motivation for us to start to start the vaccine development that that this uh, virus is, is spread by asymptomatic uh, virus positive people. So that means that means we need some sort of an international alignment that in case of outbreak, yeah, and the, the traveling activities should not based on 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 symptoms, yeah, but should really based on on the assumption of the worst case that asymptomatic um, uh, uh, individuals could could uh, carry the virus to different international loca locations. Sadly, we have already run out of time, so we have to come to a close here. But I would like to end on a personal note. Uh, what makes you happy as scientists and business leaders? Uh, what makes makes me happy is uh, to to see uh, that our vaccine reaches people and makes makes a, dif a difference. Uh, we have shipped more than two hundred million. Um, doses uh, across the world uh, as of now, and uh, we uh, get many uh, emails, feedback from people who have been vaccinated and tell their stories that they can now see their uh, grandchildren again, that they don't need to fear uh, uh, for, for their spouses who work at, as frontline healthcare workers so this is uh, these uh, are things which motivate uh, motivate us and uh, make us happy yeah and, and I can add to that of course as a scientist this is this is the biggest type of happiness uh, the daily happiness is really really uh, driven by curiosity every time when we understand something better every time when we see that we made a little progress, it provides, of course, happiness and, and further motivation. With these wonderful closing statements, I would like to thank you very much, uh, Dr. Turecci, Dr. Shahin, for your time and for sharing your insights with us. We are all very fortunate to benefit from your work in the fight against the virus. It's been an honor to welcome you to STARS. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much, so much David. David. I would also like to thank all our alumni who participated in this webinar. In the next STARS webinar on the 6th of May, we will talk with retired US four-star general John R. Allen, who currently serves as the president of the Brookings Institution. We'll talk about how to stop AI warfare before it starts. I hope to see you there. In the meantime, take care and stay healthy. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.